Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Primary HPV Cervical Cancer Screening, Supporting Data and Guidance Updates. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Roche Molecular Diagnostics. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button, lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Julia Engstrom Melnick, Medical and Scientific Affairs at Roche Diagnostics Corporation. I will now turn it over to Julia for her presentation. Thank you, Judy, and good afternoon, everyone. So we are entering a very exciting time for cervical cancer screening. Uh, just this past year in 2014, the FDA approved the very first HPV test for primary HPV uh, screening for cervical cancer. And just last month in 2015, uh, we have the first published interim guidance around the use of primary HPV uh, screening for cervical cancer. So this talk is designed to give you a little bit of a background. Uh, to these new advances and also to provide a little bit more information on, on the guidance document as well. So the PAP was first introduced uh, in the 1920s by Dr. Uh, Babes and uh, Papa Nicolau. And soon after its introduction, it became evident that this technique could potentially reduce the burden of cervical cancer by finding developing cases allowing for earlier treatment and preventing further progression. Countries began introducing screening programs based on this test in the 1950s. And in 1975, ACOG published their first cervical cancer screening recommendations, which included annual PAP testing for women 18 years and older. This adoption and widespread use has led to a dramatic reduction in cervical cancer rates. But despite these advancements, um, there are some limitations to cytology-based screening, and we need to reduce cervical cancer screening rates further. Um, here on this slide are two audits, one by the Kaiser uh, Patient Registry and one from the Swedish National Health Registry, looking at the screening history of women diagnosed with invasive cervical carcinomas. The most obvious or the most significant need in reducing cervical cancer rates is obviously reaching the underscreened or the non-screened women. Um, in both registries, the large proportion of women with invasive cerv uh, cervical carcinoma either were not screened or did not have a recent screen within the last five years uh, prior to the diagnosis. But we do still see cervical cancer affecting women that have been screened. Um, in Kaiser, about 32%, and in, in Sweden, about 24% of women with invasive cervical carcinoma actually did have a recent screen, and, it's a and it was attributed to a failure of cytology to detect uh, any precursors. So it's important to understand the limitations of the tests that we use if we hope to improve upon them. It's well known that one of the main limitations of cytology is its low sensitivity for detecting high-grade disease. In fact, there have been multiple attempts over the years to improve its sensitivity, including work, introducing workload limits, uh, liquid-based cytology, and computer-assisted screening. However, these attempts have done little to impact the overall low sensitivity of cytology, 
or on the detection of AIS and adenocarcinomas. Also, because cytology relies on a subjective impression of cellular changes uh, in cervical cancer precursors as they occur, there is often very low reproducibility. And cytology can identify women with advanced disease, but will not provide any insight as to who may be at risk of developing the, this in the future. Therefore, cytology has very limited long-term predictive value. So despite the implementation of cytology-based screening, the incidence of adenocarcinoma is increasing. This demonstrate that cytology-based screening methods are missing adenocarcinomas and their precursor lesions. And this is most likely due to sampling limitations and possibly an underrepresentation of glandular cells. When relying on a, a testing method that has very low sensitivity, this type of sampling bias has even greater implications um, because they are just simply missed. So this slide is really used to illustrate the subjectivity of cytology. As part of the ALTS trial, the National Cancer Institute had about 5,000 cytology slides reread by second cytopathologists. Each reviewer interpreted slides slide slightly differently, with only about 78% of the, the slides originally classified as normal or NILM uh, were actually considered negative when reviewed by the second cytopathology, sci, second cytopathologist. Um, not, uh, not unexpected, uh, the reproducibility of an ASCIS interpretation was only about 43%. And that's really because ASCIS is, is considered an uh, equivocal cytology interpretation. But what is surprising, or what was surprising with this study, is that um, only about 47% of the, of the slides originally classified as high grade, or H cell, were actually reclassified as that upon, this, upon second review. Again, highlighting the fact that these cytology slides um, have very low reproducibility uh, between reviewers, and there's a high level of subjectivity involved. So needless to say, cytology-based uh, cervical cancer screening has been very successful despite the fact that the underlying cause of the disease was not known for a very long time. In the 1970s, Harold Zurhausen first hypothesized that HPV uh, caused cervical cancer. And since then, there has been a tremendous amount of research um, on this area, and our knowledge has grown exponentially. Um, in fact, in 1995, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the WHO organization, uh, classified HPV-16 and HPV-18 as carcinogenic and concluded that HPV infection is a necessary cause for cervical cancer. Today, we know that almost all cervical cancers are caused by a small number of HPV genotypes. The association between HPV and cervical cancer is exceptionally strong. For example, the odds of having cervical cancer if a woman is HPV 16 positive versus HPV negative is 435. Um, and compare that to the odds of a male smoker versus a non-smoker for developing lung cancer, which is only eight. In fact, we know of all the HPV genotypes and specifically the high-risk HPV genotypes, which there are about 14 uh, recognized, only two of those H HPV 16 and HPV 18 uh, account for approximately 70% of all cervical cancers. So with this, the FDA approved the first HPV test in 1999. And since then, cervical cancer guidelines continue to evolve to provide data-driven recommendations 
that highlight the preferred method of screening includes an HPV test. Additional algorithms also incorporate HPV-16 and HPV-18 genotyping due to the, its significance in its association with cervical cancers. With our, even with our evolving understanding of HPV and despite growing awareness of cervical cancer screening limitations, Cytology-based screening remains one of the most widely used screening algorithms. This relies on cytology. Typically, this relies on cytology followed by an HPV test for ASCIS uh, interpretations. However, based on the limitations of cytology, the 2011 screening guidelines, uh, cytology screening at a three-year uh, interval is now only considered an acceptable approach for, to screen women 30 to 65. It is not the preferred method. For women 21 to 29, uh, it still remains the only screening option or have remained the sc only screening option due to concerns around excessive HPV positivity in, in this population. However, new data has since become available that provide an approach that makes HPV testing a viable option for these younger women. In these same 2011 screening guidelines, uh, for women 30 to 65, in incorporating an HPV test alongside the PAP is now considered the preferred method for screening. The use of the HPV test increases the sensitivity of the initial screen and allows for extended screening interval. In this algorithm, the HPV test is used in combination with cytology and helps drive uh, management of these results. Uh, for a woman that tests negative by cytology and uh, negative by HPV, uh, the woman should be rescreened in five years. If there's an abnormal cytology result of an ASCIS, um, but the woman's HPV negative, uh, this, the same risk stratification applies and the woman is, is again, uh, should not be rescreened until five years. For ASCIS and HPV positive, as well as uh, cytology results that are more significant than ASCIS, uh, immediate colposcopy is, is uh, recommended or indicated. However, where the HPV test lends itself uh, to improving uh, screening for these women is for the women with normal cytology but HPV positive results. These women can either be rescreened in one year, or if a 16 and 18 genotyping is used, women with 16 and 18 positive results should be referred to colposcopy. Uh, those with negative 16 and 18 results can be rescreened in one year. The reason for these new recommendations or, or these, uh, the incorporation of HPV testing is that HPV testing provides several benefits over cytology. Due to its higher sensitivity, incorporating HPV DNA testing leads to reduction in detection of CIN3 or greater or cancer in subsequent rounds of screening, which allows for a longer safety interval. HPV DNA testing improves detection, the detection of AIS and adenocarcinoma. And HPV is the first necessary cause of a human cancer ever identified. Its presence identifies women at risk of developing cervical cancer and can also be used to help uh, stratify that risk to find the women at even the highest risk of cervical cancer and more importantly, its absence provides reassurance of low, short, and long-term cervical cancer risk. In fact, HPV DNA testing reduces the incidence of invasive cervical cancer compared to cytology. 
Here is the pooled data from four large-scale European screening trials. The, this included over 176,000 women and over 1.2 million person years of follow-up. Between two and three years after screening, there begins to be an increase in the detection of invasive cervical cancers in women who were cytology negative, which is the gray line, versus the women who were HPV negative at baseline, which is the blue line. Overall, HPV DNA-based screening reduced the cervical cancer rates by 60 to 70 percent, demonstrating that when compared to cytology-based screening, HPV DNA testing offers greater safety and reduces long-term incidence of cervical cancer. It should be noted that the benefit of a combined cytology and HPV testing is predominantly due to the negative predictive value of HPV test, as the risk is not dramatically improved when the two are combined. But when it comes to the risk of cervical cancer, there really is no statistical difference. HPV testing alone provides the same reassurance against cervical cancer as a co-test. So with this, in 2014, the FDA approved the first HPV DNA test for primary HPV screening indication based on the improved safety of this strategy over cytology-based screening. In response, following the review of the FDA submission data and finding some newly published uh, large-scale studies, SGO and ASCCP jointly published interim guidance for the use of primary HPV screening. This guidance document affirms that primary HPV screening is an option for women 25 years and older. So this is the algorithm that was described in the guidance document. For women 25 years and older, an HPV, an HPV test that's FDA approved for a primary screening indication would be used in conjunction with HPV 16 and 18 genotyping. This not only relies on the more sensitive and non-subjective test as a first line test, but also incorporates immediate risk stratification. Women that, are test, that test HPV negative are at an extremely low risk of, have, of having cervical precancer, um, both at the time of screening, screening and also within the screening interval. Uh, so they should not be rescreened uh, sooner than three years. Women positive for 16 and 18 are actually those women at the highest risk of having an underlying precancerous lesion or developing uh, a cervical precancerous lesion within uh, a short period of time. So these women should be referred for immediate colposcopy for additional follow-up. Women HPV positive but negative for HPV 16 and 18 are at a much lower risk than those that are 16 and 18 positive. But these women are actually not without risk. Uh, cy cytology is then used to triage these results to identify which, wom which women in the subset have detectable cellular changes that would warrant immediate colposcopy. So only if a woman is positive for the 12 other high-risk genotypes, so non-16 and 18s, um, and have abnormal cytology should, they be re should she be referred to colposcopy. Um, if she does not have any detectable cellular changes, she should be rescreened in a year. So the guidance document was developed based on an extensive literature and data review. So not only the data that led to the, F, uh, the FDA submission data, but also 11 additional large-scale studies um, both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. 
um, and combined representatives from seven different professional societies for their expert opinions. They determined that primary HPV screening is an alternative to current cervical screening methods due to equivalent or superior effectiveness. A negative high-risk HPV test provides a greater reassurance of low CIN3 or greater risk than a negative cytology result. Um, and they also said that primary HPV screening can include women 25 to 29. This is really because of the higher uh, proportion of high-grade disease in this, in this subset of women um, and also how cytology performs in detecting these cervical precancers. They also stated very clearly that only an FDA-approved assay with specific primary HPV screening indications should be used. And that's really because although there are several HPV assays that are currently FDA approved, um, only one ha has this specific indication. Um, and all of these assays vary, uh, have slight variations in, in uh, their performance characteristics. And so no assumption should be made that these are equivalent assays. So the effectiveness of primary HPV screening is mainly determined by the risks associated with the negative screening results. Risk of CIN3 or greater over three years following a negative HPV test at baseline, which is the, uh, the lower curve in blue, is half that following a negative PAP result uh, at baseline, which is the upper curve in, in gray. As expected, the rise in the slope is much more pronounced following a negative uh, baseline PAP result than a negative HPV result. And this really highlights that long-term risk assessment is limited when only assessing current cell abnormalities. So there's a much greater level of safety following a negative HPV result than a negative cytology result. And these findings uh, from Athena were also mirrored across other uh, large-scale studies. Uh, so this is a table taken from the new uh, uh, interim guidance document that was that were published in 2015 or just last month. Um, and across all these studies, a negative HPV test resulted in at least half the three and five year risk of both CIN3 and greater and cervical cancer uh, than cytology. Additionally, HPV 16 and 18 genotyping provides greater risk stratification, not only identifying women at the, with the highest probability of having an underlying high-grade lesion at baseline, but also over the screening interval. In Athena, one in four women with a baseline HPV positive result developed CIN3 within three years. Although lower than HPV 16 positive women, HPV 18 positive women were still at a statistically higher risk of developing CIN3 or greater than those positive for the 12 other high risk HPV types, exceeding 10% risk of, for CIN3 within three years. Women testing positive for the 12 other high risk HPV types or at a substantially lower risk of CIN3 or greater, reaching about 5% uh, within three years. So whereas HPV status will predict which women are essentially free from risk, HPV genotyping more accurately predicts which women will subsequently develop high-grade cervical cancer precursors. This risk stratification better assesses a woman's need for immediate colposcopy and helps balance rates of referral to the disease cases detected. As we try to simplify and improve how we screen by introducing primary HPV screening, a consideration must be made as to when to initiate this 
the screening. Uh, the 2011 U.S. screening guidelines did not recommend HPV testing for women 25 to 29 years of age unless it's used as a reflex to an ASCUS path. This is largely due to the fact that HPV infections are very common and typically transient in this age group. However, in the recent interim guidance, the professional societies did acknowledge that there's a high burden of CIN3 in this age group and cytology, which is the standard of care, performs poorly in this population. But because these new recommendations are a departure from the previous guidelines, there are a few questions that we really should address. Uh, one is why include women 25 to 29? How is high prevalence of high risk HPV and the referrals to colposcopy balanced in this age group? And what considerations should be made around regression of high grade disease in young women? So first, let's look at the incidence of cervical cancer by age group in the US. Data from the National Cancer Institute's SEER Tumor Registry shows that a sharp rise in the incidence of invasive cervical cancer occurs between the age of 25 to 34 years of age. Cervical cancer is unique, or cervical cancer screening is unique in the, in the fact that we detect and manage cervical cancer precursors before cervical cancer develops. So the ultimate goal of cervical cancer screening is not to detect cancer, but to prevent the diagnosis of cervical cancer altogether. So this suggests that initiation of screening should ideally occur during the sharp uh, increase in cervical cancer incidence just prior to the peak if we want to reduce those subsequent diagnoses. In practice, we actually do screen women over the age of 21. But the question really is, are we screening effectively? So in Athena, which is a large US-based registrational trial referenced in the guidance document, a third of all identified cervical precancers in women 25 years of age and older were found in women 25 to 29 years of age. To put this into perspective, let's take a look at the distribution of these cases based on the number of women actually represented within each age group. What we can see that there's actually more high grade disease in the 6,647 women in this five year age group of 25 to 29 than in any other age group. This demonstrates that the highest burden of disease is actually in women 25 to 29, so this youngest age group. And keep in mind, this age range is also right at the start of the sharp incline in cervical cancer diagnoses. So the question is, are, are we effective in current screening practices? So we just saw that there was a high burden of disease in women 25 to 29. And keep in mind, women 30 years and older, according to the 2011 screening guidelines, um, have a safety net built in. So these women are, are co-tested. So they have both an HPV test and a cytology test. So although cytology may not detect all the cervical precancers, that combined HPV test will help add to that sensitivity of the cytology results. But for women 25 to 29, with the highest burden of disease, cytology up to this point has been the only option. And cytology failed to detect more than 56% of these cervical precancers. This is more than any other grade age group and in an age range that has the highest burden of precancer. It suggests 
that current screening with cytology is inadequate in identifying underlying CIN3 or greater lesions. It simply is not sensitive enough. But if we simplify, but if we simply screen with HPV, effectively increasing sensitivity, a large proportion of women will be referred for follow-up testing. As expected, HPV positivity is at, is at the highest in the youngest age group and declines with age. In Athena, the, uh, the percent of women 25 to 29 that were HPV positive was about 21%. So how can we balance this high prevalence of high-risk HPV and the referrals to colposcopy in this age group? One way to reduce the immediate referrals is to focus on the group of women that are at the highest risk of cervical cancer um, and risk of cervical precancer. And these are the women that are HPV 16 and or HPV 18 positive. In Athena, only about 7% of women 25 to 29 were positive for one of these two genotypes. And the proportion of women 25 to 29 that were HPV or H16 or HPV18 positive is actually much smaller than the number with abnormal cytology. By simply using HPV 16 and 18 genotyping for women 25 to 29, the smallest group of women with the highest association of cervical precancer would be referred to for immediate colposcopy. And with this shift in screening strategy for women 25 to 29, look how much better we can do. We can increase the effectiveness of screening by detecting 30% more CIN3 or greater cases than by cytology. And that's just for the HPV 16 and 18 positive cases. By incorporating the 12 other high-risk HPV types um, with a path triage, we can improve the detection of CIN3 or greater even further. It's important to note that high-grade disease found in young women is more likely associated with HPV 16 than any other genotype. And the mean age for HPV 16 positive CIN3 or greater lesions is below the age of 30. HPV 16 positive CIN3 was most commonly diagnosed in younger women versus older women, further highlighting the effectiveness of genotyping in screening younger women. In fact, even in the very youngest age group, so those women 13 to 24, which presumably have the overall highest clearance rates, HPV 16 and 18 positive lesions were less likely to regress than non-HPV 16 and 18. But we can even take this discussion a step further, and we can look at the overall effectiveness of varying, various screening methods, including uh, women 25 to 29. So in discussions of cervical cancer screening and screening modalities, in the 2011 Cervical Cancer Screening Guidelines, they acknowledge that the benefit of screening should be balanced against the potential harms with the total number of colposcopies serving as a surrogate measure for harm, and benefits being the overall detection of CIN3 or greater lesions. The Athena study provides an opportunity to evaluate both the benefit and potential harms of screening when various combinations of cytology, high-risk HPV testing, and genotyping for HPV 16 and 18 are used to develop a screening algorithm for women 25 years and older. For simplicity's sake, the focus will be on three algorithms supported by U.S. screening uh, guidelines. The first is cytology, which relies on HPV testing to triage ASCUS results for women 25 years and older. The second is the co-testing strategy, 
relying on a one-year co-test rescreen for women with normal cytology and HPV positive results. Keep in mind that this co-testing strategy is only for women 30 years and older. The third is a primary HPV screening algorithm, which is now supported by SGO and ASCCP as a screening option in these latest interim guidance. Because the analyses evaluate the performance in two different age groups, women 25 years and older and women 30 years and older, certain modifications to the co-test and screening algorithm must be considered. For women 25 and older, it's actually going to be a hybrid strategy. Um, and it combines the cytology method for women 25 to 29, combined with the co-testing algorithm for women 30 years and older. For women 30 years and older, this hybrid strategy is actually uh, going to be more of a co-testing strategy or solely co-testing. So when comparing the effectiveness or the efficiency of the screening methods, uh, we look at the number of CIN3 cases detected and the number of colposcopies performed. And more specifically, we're looking at the number of colposcopies that are needed to be performed uh, for each CIN3 case detected. For women 25 years and older, Primary HPV screening detected nearly 40% more CIN3 or greater lesions at baseline than either of the two uh, other two screening modalities. The superior performance actually extended over the three years with uh, greater than 20% more CIN3 or greater lesions detected than the hybrid strategy and 64% more than cytology for women 25 years and older. For women 30 years and older, primary HPV screening detected nearly 30% more CIN3 or greater at baseline than either of the other two screening methods. By year three, it detected 50% more CIN3 or greater cases than cytology and the co-testing method nearly caught up. But keep in mind that many of these subsequent cases may remain undetected if a loss to follow-up is a concern in various clinical practices. Although higher than cytology, the number of colposcopies performed per identified case of CIN3 or greater for primary HPV screening was nearly identical to the hybrid strategy and also the co-testing strat strategy uh, for both age groups. But how does primary HPV perform, uh, primary screening perform in women 25 to 29? By extending HPV primary screening down to age 25 from 30, 102 additional CIN3 or greater cases are detected versus only 51 for cytology. That's, actually, that's exactly twice the number of CIN3 cases detected by primary HPV screening than would be detected by cytology. With this increase in sensitivity, the number of colposcopies would naturally also increase. By including women 25 to 29, an additional 1,247 uh, colposcopies will be performed with primary HPV screening. However, this is actually less than twice the number of additional colposcopies uh, performed following cytology. This means that the higher proportional gain in CIN3 or greater sensitivity for women 25 to 29 actually makes the colposcopies performed with following the primary HPV screening algorithm more efficient. In other words, HPV primary screening identifies more CIN3 or greater than cytology while requiring fewer colposcopies per disease case detected for women 25 to 29. 
proving that HPV primary screening is the most effective screening strategy for this age group. In a similar vein, if we add cytology testing for, for women 25 to 29 to the co-testing hybrid strategy, the number of colposcopies needed to detect each CIN3 or greater case actually shifts compared to primary HPV screening and actually becomes less efficient. This is mainly due to the significantly fewer cases of CIN3 or, or greater cases detected when relying on cytology. So as we try to improve how we screen by introducing primary HPV screening, a consideration must be made as to when to initiate this. There's a high burden of CIN3 or greater in women 25 to 29, which is the current, and the current standard of care, which is uh, cytology testing, really performs uh, poorly in this population. HPV testing increases the sensitivity and detection of these high-grade uh, lesions and strategies relying on HPV 16 and 18 genotyping um, as, as well as cytology uh, can effectively stratify risk and limit the, the overall referrals to colposcopy. Rates of colposcopies is not an accurate measure of the potential harms of screening as risks associated with this procedure and treatments accompanying these may have been overstated. And it's important to consider that there must be a threshold for which a colposcopy is acceptable even for women 25 to 29. It may be that the potential uh, discomfort and anxiety associated with a follow-up procedure is tolerated if the alternative is a missed precancerous lesion. It's clear that cervical cytology appears to have reached the point where it alone is unable to do, reduce cervical cancer rates further. The benefits of primary HPV screening include the increased detection of cervical cancer precursors, especially for women 25 to 29. The best balance of benefits and harms using HPV testing as a first line primary screen is a triage strategy, strategy that include integrated HPV 16 and 18 genotyping, as well as cytology of the 12 other high-risk HPV uh, genotypes. Primary HPV testing is now an alternative option to current cytology-based screening methods due to equivalent or superior perform uh, effectiveness. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I will turn it back to Judy to answer some of the questions. I see the question tab flashing. Uh, so I want to try and address as many as I can within the allotted time. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, what about testing for low risk genotypes? Uh, sure, I actually get this question quite, quite a bit. Um, so low risk HPV genotypes, or I should say, so HPV, um, encompasses many, many different uh, types of this virus. Um, over a hundred have been identified. Um, only 14 have actually been linked to cervical cancer. And these are considered the high risk HPV genotypes. Low risk HPV genotypes can cause cellular changes and abnormalities. Um, that are kind of considered high grade, but they have never been demonstrated to then cross that threshold into invasive cervical cancer. So there really is no clinical utility for detecting low risk HPV genotypes. 
So it's also important to have an HPV test that doesn't have any cross reactivity or that uh, inadvertently detect these genotypes. Again, because there is no clinical uh, indication for it. Okay, our next question. Does the FDA labeling require cytology as a reflex for all HPV positive or just non-1618 results? Sure, so the FDA approval, as well as the guidance document, um, stipulate that HPV 16 and 18 women um, are at a sufficiently high enough risk that they should be referred immediately to colposcopy, regardless of what their cytology results are. Um, women that are 12 other high-risk HPV uh, genotype positive, but negative for 16 and 18, um, they are at, uh, at risk for cervi uh, cervical precancer, but their risk is significantly lower uh, than the other two genotypes. Um, like I mentioned, these women are not free from risk entirely. So cytology is then used to really help stratify that risk a little bit better or kind of fine tune that risk uh, a little bit more. Um, HPV positivity is actually can be very high in certain populations. So we do not want to send every single woman with an HPV positive result to colposcopy, but rather uh, the women at the highest risk are the ones should, that should be followed and potentially managed at that time. Next question is, did Roche fund the study that was the basis for HPV primary screening? Uh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> so Roche did fund the Athena study. This was Roche's clinical trial for the COBOS HPV test. Uh, so that trial and the data that, that culminated from that trial was submitted to the FDA for review. Um, that included a potential for the COBOS test to be used as a frontline primary HPV screening. Um, the FDA reviewed that data uh, alongside a, a panel of experts a, a medical, with the, their medical device uh, panel, um, and it reviewed that data for safety and effectiveness. Um, and they independently then gave a stamp of approval based on that review to the test. The guidance document uh, published by SGO and ASCCP uh, reviewed that data independently as well, um, but they also utilized uh, additional studies, large-scale studies, both from the U.S. and ex-U.S., so a total of 11 additional references uh, to make their recommendation and, and to kind of evaluate the utility of primary uh, HPV screening. Um, so in some respect, yes, we funded one small little subset, of this bigger scope of primary HPV screening. Um, but Roche did not influence the guidance document in any way. Um, and again, the FDA works independently to review all tests for safety and effectiveness. What percentage of CIN3 plus are missed by HPV primary with Roche in your clinical trial? So that's going back to looking at the safety of a negative HPV test. Um, and this is really evaluated for any test. Um, what we look at or how these trials are, the clinical, how this particular clinical trial was designed, the Athena, was to really test to really stress the test to its full potential or really make sure that we were detecting any possible case that could be missed by, by the actual test itself. Um, so women received a colposcopy regardless of, for any abnormal result, whether or not be a cytology abnormal or, H, 
or HPV uh, positive result. Those women received colposcopy and biopsies. Um, and we also performed an exit colposcopy. So any woman who did not have disease uh, found during the three-year follow-up were then given an exit colposcopy at the time of exit. Um, again, to just assess whether or not there were any, any residual disease was missed. Um, so the, the end point to that or the three-year risk of a negative COBOS HPV test was 0.34% uh, uh, from the clinical trial. And that's compared to a negative PATH in that three-year span was about 0.78%. So again, the risks of a negative HPV test was, was half that of a negative cytology result. Do you know if types HPV 16, 18 are more vir virulent than other types of HPV or are they just more prevalent compared to other types? Um, sure. So HPV 16 and 18 are actually not the most prevalent HPV genotypes. Um, so I kind of showed that the prevalence rates of HPV in the Thenas uh, trial. So just looking at the 25 to 29s, for example, 21% of women 25 to 29 were positive for HPV. But HPV 16 and 18 only accounted for 7% of those positive cases. Um, so that's a third of all the HPV positives. So they're not the most prevalent as, as an entity. They are the most virulent. And by virulent, I mean that they are highly persistent, meaning an infection with an HPV 16 or 18 is less likely to clear or regress. Um, they are more likely to progress, so actually increase in severity with time. Um, and with that, they are, and the time frame for that progression um, or that shift to more severe cases is actually much shorter than, than all the other genotypes. Um, so they are absolutely the, the most virulent. HPV 18 is also very unique because it has a very high uh, proportion, it accounts for a very high proportion of adenocarcinomas. Um, so that adds to its significance uh, for genotyping and cervical cancer screening. Okay, please clarify. The future risk of cancer with co-tests versus, versus HPV primary at three years is lower in gauge study and in fact, statistically significant according to the publication. You said there is no difference, is that correct? Um, so for CIN3 or CIN2, there's a, a difference, but for cervical cancer incidence, there is no difference. And that was because the error bars overlapped, that is not a statistically significant difference. So it's very clear on distinguishing that from the other. Um, keep in mind, we are, uh, the, the utility of cervical cancer screening is really to minimize their risk or the development of cervical cancer. And when two tests combined has really no statistical significance over subsequent cancer diagnosis, uh, that's where that plays in a role. Your next question is a two-part question. Um, since the data demonstrates high sensitivity for young women, should older women be excluded for this test? And the second part is when detecting HRHPV in young women, what is the intervention following colposcopy confirmation? Uh, lesion resection or cervical resection? Um, so women, over the age of 30 should be screened. 
uh, with cytology and HPV, um, again, to assess their risks. Uh, these women have a much higher inc overall incidence of cervical cancer. And actually, older women, and I use the term older very loosely, um, are at a risk of cervical cancer that may not necessarily be 16 and 18 positive. Um, so there's absolutely a utility for screening uh, women older than, uh, older than just the small young population. Um, and I think I, I missed half the second half of that question. Um, and I know it had something to do with management strategies. Um, if, if that's okay, I'm gonna answer that uh, with, with whoever asked that specifically, because um, I have to go back and read it. Okay. I believe we have time for one more question. So it will be, uh, what percentage of patients with HPV 16, 18 progress to CIN2 plus any difference between 16 and 18 progression rates? Um, yeah, so there's absolutely a difference in progression rates. Um, and uh, forgive me if I don't know those rates uh, right off the top of my head. Um, I can definitely follow up with the, the, um, the person who asked this question. Uh, HPV 16 and 18 does progress um, more rapidly and more uh, frequently than non-HPV 16 and 18 uh, positive women. There's also studies that demonstrate that HPV 16 infections uh, tend to uh, progress most, much more readily in women younger than age 30 than those that are older than 30. Um, but I will follow up with you to get a little bit more clarification on that. Um, and I think Judy indicated that this was the last question. Um, for those questions I did not answer and those questions that I promised a follow up, um, you will, uh, I will address each one of them. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single one with it a lot of time. But I do want to thank you all for joining us. Um, and it's been a pleasure. And um, again, I thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. Any questions not addressed live during the allotted time will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. For more information, we would like to invite you to visit www.hpv16and18.com. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Roche Molecular Diagnostics, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 10th. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.